All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to this uh, Transient Universe uh, conference. So this afternoon, we have two uh, speakers. So the first uh, speaker will be Professor Roger Blanford from Stanford University. Uh, so uh, his talk will be on these holes and jets recent development and the future prospect. Uh, please join me thank, uh, or to welcome Professor Blanford. Thank you very much. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, thanks very much, and thanks very much for the uh, satisfying a long desire to visit Singapore. I've never been here before, and it's been great. Uh, uh, I haven't seen much of Singapore yet, so uh, but I'm hoping to get outside the cockpit. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Um, and uh, very glad to be here. And uh, I three sort of uh, asked him what to talk about, and he uh, agreed that I should. Well, he he said that I should. Uh, do two things. One is speaking generalities rather than uh, describe my latest model for something or other, uh, and also be provocative. So I'm going to try and satisfy both of those, and I try and uh, uh, irritate some people in the audience, I'm not sure. Okay, uh, some of this is done with uh, many collaborators, but there are three who are rather prominent in some of this. Okay, um, so this is what I'm going to try and talk about in a very sort of scattershot way, and I'm just going to try and make a few points that are not particularly well connected or organized. And uh, I'm going to sort of try and navigate my way around some many of the other talks here. So implicit will be the content of the other talks. And uh, total comprehension and acceptance by me uh, goes without saying. OK, so I'm going to talk about these, these general topics in this order, more or less. And then, so let's start with a transient universe. I find this a rather threatening title. And um, I don't know uh, whether with this meeting the whole universe is going to disappear. Um, but uh, uh, it's also been sort of, you know, uh, multi-messenger multi astronomy and uh, the sort of general idea of doing transit astronomy. Of course, it's not new. It's the rule, not the exception. Uh, just makes some little precepts here uh, that we've seen a lot, more ve a lot more evidence in recent years of rapid variability from extended regions. And I mean by extended in terms of light crossing times. And uh, I'll say a little bit about that. Uh, I won't say so much about this, but I, I, I would like to draw attention to it. It's something that actually Andy Lawrence has just written a, a sort of nature editorial on. And I sort of wholeheartedly agree. Um, and this is the notion that uh, the disk inactive galactic nuclei, and this is again sort of moving a little bit away from what most people here are directly working on, but I bring this for a purpose. The disks that are accretion disks, they're sort of simple ones, you know, they follow what's in the textbooks and so on, except that they don't. Uh, you, you've got continuous emission that comes from the surface of an accretion disk, and it's just like a star, but in lots of different radii and temperature goes, varies with distance and so on. Uh, and one of the things you know is that the characteristic time scale for variability ought to be just be the viscous time scale. And that's fairly direct and simple. Uh, and, and it isn't. It's very, they're varying much more rapidly than that. Now, for, for an AGN um, uh, observer, they're much more patient than you lot. And uh, they, that rapid variability is sort of year, year to a decade or something. But, but, but it's long. It's short, I mean, compared with what it should be. Uh, and then uh, the other thing, of course, to say is that uh, I've invented this new acronym here, ERB. I noticed that the, not so long ago, the new trendy thing in this business was GRBs. Then they became FRBs. And I can complete the sequence. So this is an uh, extremely ridiculous burst. And it's going to be the next thing that will be discovered because there's so many things out there that are just primed to find new transient phenomena. The ZTF, LSST, uh, CTA, all these things coming along, not to mention LIGO, uh, O3 and all the rest of it. So it will be astonishing if there isn't something, an ERB that's found in that. OK, so let's say a little bit about some of this stuff. And it just, I'm just trying to broaden people's horizons a little bit for a purpose. So here's the Crab Nebula. Um, uh, so uh, it pulses, of course. That's transient astronomy, if ever there was one. And it's now up to 400 GeV and belong, actually beyond that. As we mentioned uh, yesterday, there's a secular decline in this well-known standard flux uh, calibrator. And, uh, and then the thing that's perhaps the most stunning of all, because this is our best laboratory for high energy astrophysics, are these 
sort of more or less annual variations in the, in the Fermi ga gamma ray flux, and actually, I suppose, and here's just the examples of it, and you get roughly one to 10 hour variations in a 10 light year nebula. And it's coming from the nebula. And somehow or other, a very concentrated region in a very large nebula has got to vary very fast. And this, is, this should be generic. This is a relative, generic relativistic source. It's only special because it's near to us and bright. OK, so there's extreme particle acceleration going. Just to give you some idea of this, you can say this generically that the most conservative explanation has the particles cooling in less than one orbit, one gyro orbit. That's a sort of model independent statement. That gives you some idea of what you've got to do to get particles up to that energy. So this is sort of stunning stuff. The blazers, that's pretty stunning stuff. I mean, I. You're not impressed by five-minute variations if you work on LIGO, but uh, lasers are big. You know, they're 100, 100 million solar mass black holes, and everything scales with that. So uh, the, 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 the TV variation from the ground-based Cherenkov telescopes, uh, it, you know, there are many examples now of minute variations in these sources. Um, uh, and in the Fermi, there's GV variations in several sources, 3C279 three minutes in the co-moving frame in the, in the it's, it's, excuse me, in the, in the rest frame, cosmological rest frame, the co-moving frame, that translates to six seconds. These, this is very rapid variability. This is a quasar, this is a, a massive quasar, the redshift of a half. Uh, there's, there's the data there, okay? Um, now, there's a real problem, physics problem here. Uh, in 3D we trust, okay? And there's the opacity, a gamma ray trying to escape from this region has an opacity in soft photons to make electron positron pairs. So there's a gamma sphere outside which this emission must come. It's a long way out and the most conservative of models. And so it's got to, and yet you've got to get this rapid variation from that region outside. Sound like, sounds a bit like the crab nebula. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Generally, it's assumed in these sources there's two humps. Um, I, I, uh, uh, so there's two humps usually, you can sort of see it there. Um, I, I like to, uh, it's like a fitting a camel, it's a uh, Bactrian. Uh, so there's a B on its side like that as opposed to the dromedary, which is one hump. But there's two humps here, and one is associated with the synchrotron, and the other is associated with the Compton. Okay, and that's a general generic explanation, but that may not be right. This, the problem with having this Compton here, as I'm going to say, is if you believe that the inner parts of the jet, where, where these jets are coming from are extracting spin energy from the hole or from the inner accretion disk even, they're highly magnetized. That's totally inconsistent with this being a Compton hump and being variable and coming from a very small radius. Something is seriously wrong there. Uh, there's, a, there's an alternative way of doing this, and that is, I'm not sure that this works, but it's to make this synchrotron radiation, but to rely on, and this should interest us a little bit, is to uh, take protons up to PEV energies and then have them just cascade down in and create electrons and positrons of enormous energy, which just lose energy very rapidly through synchrotron radiation. So that's a completely dish different and radically different emission mechanism than that which has been generally assumed in countless models of these sources. Moving on, 3C273, the most famous one of all, superluminal expansion. V, of, v is of 10C. For those who work on GRBs, this is slow, OK? You can talk about 500 or 1,000 or something. I don't know how you do it, but they do. Uh, 10 C, and you can actually measure it and see it. Um, again, the rapid variability, not quite as extreme as 3C279, but well documented. So, um, so this, is, this is the transient universe. And one of the things that I think this is a, a point that I would make, and certainly Andy Lawrence makes in this context, but I think in more general context is this sort of idea of non-locality in getting uh, the place where the energy may be taken is quite remote from the place where it's actually dissipated into particle, particle emission. And we, that's not a, uh, a feature of many models, but it's something that we've got to come to terms with, I think. So let's talk a little bit more about similarities and differences. And here I'm sort of, again, trying to get out into this um, broader community of astronomers rather than the one thing that I and you work on and, uh, very, and just sort of see what one can learn from other types of sources. And in the spirit of in order to make um, progress on anything, you've got to understand everything. It isn't in that. It's more a question. It's hard enough to figure out what's going on in these sources. And you should take every clue you can. So if you get some clues from some totally different systems, generic physical processes, then that's something you should exploit. 
So the first thing is distant jets are everywhere. Here, I can show some examples in a moment. And then the other thing is, the other feature of this is really if you try to make the connection between stellar type sources and massive black holes and their accretion distance and so on in AGN, then there are simple scalings. Most sim things just scale simply with the mass in prescribed way, but there are some things that break that scaling, in particular effective temperatures and so on. So there's a little bit more to it than that, and there are other parameters involved, but what well, could perhaps go a long way um, uh, for, uh, you know, regarding uh, galactic superluminal sources as being quasars for the impatience. And so they, you know, the time scales are maybe, you know, 10 million times shorter. So let's just look at a little bit of that. So, so here's the Vela pulsar. There's a jet there. Now, there's no, this is a pulsar. Okay, there's a jet. Um, I'm not saying that you, it's the same as the jet that comes out of a uh, 170817 or something, if there is one, um, but it's, it's a similar phenomenon. Here's, here's a, a HH34, it's a protostellar object. There's a very good jet. This actually is an honest to God AGN. This is picture A, dead straight, X ray jet there. So. Uh, it isn't as though you've got to understand everything, but there may be some clues in the whatever produces that might be at work in other in, in where, whatever you're working on. That's the only point I'd make there. M87, okay, that's the cluster going down. You sort of kind of know this. I won't give the commentary. Uh, that's what it is more or less now. Do a little bit better actually um, on the about the uh, 30m scale, and I'm going to harbour a little bit on M87 for a reason I'll come to. We know about the rotation of the gas in the in a disk around the, the jet so we know what the ang the sense of the angular momentum. Okay, now I'll come back to that point in a moment. That's the only point I want to make. And of course we also know that there's a um come there we are. Uh, that, where uh, uh, back one uh, somewhere I said a six should have said somewhere here. Oh yeah six there it is six billion solar mass black hole. Although some people think it might be a little bit smaller than that. But that's okay. That's it's in, not the most massive, they go up to about 20 billion now. Um, but it's a very large black hole. Again, that's for the scaling. So we know quite a bit about M87. I'll return to that. Oh, no, I've got it here. OK, so the first thing is, um, these are VLBI observations. And it relates a little bit to what C was talking about this morning. Uh, you can see these jets actually collimating. And uh, you, you can measure it down to about 30. And these are VLBI measurements. And you see a parabolic profile down to about 20 or 30 m so far. And it's consistent with it sort of correlating on, on that sort of scale. That's, that's the first thing point. And then the second thing is, um, there's, um, you can see most clearly here, but there are other maps than one I just showed you. There's, in the jet itself, it looks like there's limb brightening. It looks like there's edge features there. And there are two explanations that have been advanced for this. And the, there's the spine sheath view, which is there's a fast-moving spine to the jet, and then the sheath outside. Many people have proposed that. And, and in the case of M87, which is probably about 20 degrees to the line of sight, you could have the, the core of this jet could be moving at such high speed you just don't see it at all. Um, uh, there are some problems with that, but this, you know, the, it's natural to associate this emission here with particle acceleration happening in a boundary layer, in some sort of shear layer. It might be, might be a current sheet. It might be a fluid dynamical boundary layer. Both of those are probably present at some level. But that's where the dissipation is going, and dissipation equals particle acceleration in these sort of circumstances. So um, and then the other thing is you can see the count, but maybe this is a little bit dodgy here, but you can see the counter jet and the same thing going on there. So one is a special case where you can actually see the counter jet and you'll learn something. And again, I'll come back to this, why I've made a big point about this. The spin, uh, just to remind you that this, of course, could be the reason why some jets succeed in, um, in the success-oriented way as phi, and some fail as miserable failures. Uh, and it could just be the central spin. And just to make the point here, let's go back to Roy Kerr and so on and Roger Penrose, um, the, there's a sort of irreducible mass of the black hole related to the area, which classically must increase. And this. Uh, irreducible mass means that up to 30% of the mass of the whole is available for the, is there for the taking. And that's, and, and typically, if you, the best way to do this is probably to extract it electromagnetically, and the typical efficiency of doing that is about a half. A half increases the, is dissipated inside the horizon, the other half is just outside one way or another. 
Um, and uh, and this, this is sort of there for the taking. It's hard to believe it isn't taken. It isn't just a question of a special pleading that this is a possible other source. It's hard to believe that there aren't magnetic fields there. And if there are magnetic fields there, they will take a spinning hole. And we've measured spins in holes in AGN and stellar sources, and they're large in many cases. Not always, but in many cases. OK, so, and this compares, you know, this is competitive in some sense with the, the, so the binding energy of the marginally stable orbit. So, um, so my point here is really think broadly. Don't try and explain everything, but do think about what you can learn from other systems, because there are important clues there, I think. OK, let's talk about modes of accretion. And traditionally, there have been sort of three that have been identified, particularly in the context of quasars. One is subcritical. And here the view is that the, in a typical stationary accretion flow, the, um, uh, the rate of infall is, in fact, shorter than the time it takes hot ions in the middle of the disk, in the central part of the disk, uh, to heat the electrons. And so if nothing else is going on, you just have Coulomb scattering, then you've got cold electrons and hot ions. The hot ions make a thick accretion disk because they can't cool, and the electrons are too cold to cool. Now, if you've got plasma physics there, then you'll heat up the electrons. The electrons will radiate, essentially, by standard non-thermal processes, and, the and that hot, hot torus will, will deflate. And that's been a question now for 30 years as to what, whether this actually happens. If it doesn't happen, then you get this iron torus. And most simulations and most models have assumed that there's an iron torus there that's making a funnel that's making the jet when you've got the jet. If there's something an intermediate mass supply, then that has been traditionally associated with a sort of standard Shakuras and the IF type accretion disk. It's re efficiently radiative. There's a photosphere there. Maybe there's a little bit of a corona. But it's basically like, like the sun. There's a photosphere there, just the effective temperature. And it radiates away. It doesn't work well, as we've just seen. It's generally supposed that there's no jet, just a weak wind. And this is associated with things like the narrow line sea for galaxies and so on, which have the so-called, I'll come back to this in a moment, a, a, a lamppost. They have, uh, they have the irradiated disk that fluoresces iron lines by which you measure the spin, OK? But no jets. So jets don't have to form. And, and these are associated with black holes that are spinning. So it isn't just the spin that determines if you have, you've got a jet. And then the supercritical supplies, again, this is commonly associated with thick accretion disks. And that's because the photons, there's no problem with them radiating. The endothermal equilibrium quite quickly there. They're there. Um, but they're trapped by electron scattering, and they get dragged in, carried along faster. They're sort of adiabatic flow, unless there's very high densities, in which case you can deflate these disks, these thick disks, using neutrino cooling. So neutrinos at the, the um, uh, supernovae and the, uh, GR, uh, uh, and the GRBs can deflate the disks then. Most of this is sort of prosecuted, particularly again, if one comes to the miracle things, without too much regard to the thermodynamics of what's going on, the sort of ad hoc prescriptions that are made, this may matter seriously. OK, and the radiative transfer is being tackled to some extent, but it is pretty um, so far. Let me make a point about this. And this is something that point Mitch and I made many years ago, is that um, if you consider sort of simple radiative accretion disks, again, going back to the uh, well, actually, the 50s, actually, this was first done. And you have simple conservation laws. The mass per unit radius, mu, times the info velocity v is constant. The angular momentum here, where that's a specific angular momentum of a th thin Keplerian disk. Then you inevitably reach the conclusion that in, in the intermediate part of the disk, you radiate three times the locally dissipated uh, binding energy. So whatever binding energy you've lost, the infalling gas, you get three times as much radiated from that radius. And the deficit is, and the e excess is made up by a deficit at the small radius. And so the, the, you don't gain anything from this. It's just the key thing is that any torque that can evolve in an accretion disk, it doesn't, can be anything you want. It could be a piece of sandpaper. It could be magnetic field, whatever you want. Any torque that's going to evolve an accretion disk inevitably transports energy outward. It does work at a rate g omega, where g is the torque and omega is the angular frequency, sends energy outwards. So that's 
this is all well and good. Sorry, go back. Sorry, Juan. Uh, back. Okay, there. Um, but it has a consequence when you cannot cool, when you've got these very subcritical or supercritical accretions, when you cannot cool, that, tor that energy gets transported outwards if the disk is evolving. And that is, if you cannot get rid of that energy by photons or neutrinos, it will unbind the disk. It, it will, that energy will be carried off in some outflow, one form or another. Might be magnet, hydromagnetic, might be electromagnetic, might be purely gas dynamic, but one way or another, you've got to get rid of that energy. The divergence of that energy flux has got to be carried out. Otherwise, you will simply unbind the disk. It's as simple as that. And this is an important point. I think it's not, again, not really quite appreciated, the consequences of that. OK, so we've got the, another sort of scattershot thought here is that the, these fluorescent ion lines I've mentioned are famous for measure, you being used to measure the spin of the black hole and shown in many cases they are highly rotating. Their models are predicated and they're being thin disks. They're seen in the CFOTs, the XR binaries and so on. These are the things and then they now use reverberation mapping and so on on the basis of these analyses. And they're pretty careful and pretty intricate but still not absolutely, I would say, watertight. There's still some recent rounds of ground. But the simplest interpretation is we've got a disk like that, and the source of the illumination is what they call the lamppost, which is suspended by pure thought above the horizon of a black hole. It is not an easy thing to do mechanically, but I'll come to how it might happen. OK, so, so this is the thought. That's just data. Um, well, it's data. It's good data. Uh, but uh, the thought is, and this is sort of squiggly, uh, magnetic fields are green, so here's a magnetic field like that. And you imagine that you've got field lines that leave the disk, and they're actually directed inwards. Then um, what you end up with, uh, uh, gas on these field lines will be flung inwards. The field lines themselves will be wrapped, as, I, as they say in an American expression, wrapped around the axle, which means you don't know what you're talking about more or less, and so you, uh, you wrap them so you have this sort of region here like this where there's going to be an immense amount of dissipation right above the disk at the location of the alleged lamppost. Stuff above will go out, stuff below will fall in. It'll be like a stagnation point, but jerking about all over the place, being pulled here and there. It'll make comptonized x-rays there, which will hit, illuminate the accretion disk and, and then create the iron lines which, which we see. Um, now, the details of this are yet to be worked out, and this isn't want, want of trying on behalf of my colleagues and myself, but we haven't got there yet. We don't have a really viable model, but as a picture, that is one of the things we've been thinking about, is to try and put some physical manifestation in what is otherwise a kinematical a conclusion. So, um, so the, I think the message from here, and this is an observational one, is that... Um, I remember Rich Rosowski once telling me that he'd been studying um, accretion all his life and he'd never seen anything, he'd never seen it, he'd only ever seen stuff going out. I didn't quite mean that, but uh, there is a bit of a problem observation. We want to see how much gas is falling in. We don't see that terribly well. And there probably should be large winds there too, and they are very much worth seeking. out. Now obviously we do see more of these now, but there's more of those in the optically thin cases like the AGN and the X-ray binders to look for those. OK, a little bit about initial conditions. And this is more thinking about the, what's going into the sim these wonderful simulations, many of which have been exhibited here. Um, quite often, the output of these simulations is dictated by the initial conditions. If you create a giant uh, thick torus, you shouldn't be surprised if you create a well collimated jet. And if you made a thin disk, you'd have got something different. And so quite often, there's an uh, almost hidden assumption that you sort of put in the, um, the output at, at the beginning. Uh, there's the gas supply. That may have a huge difference in, uh, may make a huge difference in what actually happens in an accretion disk. Uh, uh, if you try and understand the outer parts of the accretion disk in an AGN, then there are many options there, including star formation in the disk itself. OK, is the gas supplied in a molecular form, in an atomic form? Is it magnetized or is it not magnetized? That's all terribly important. The spin of the hole, that's obviously important for the black hole, 
that you see. It might also be of interest for the, uh, for the LIGO events, for the, well, LIGO events, but the events to come with the neutron stars. With, there have been uh, people talking about the neutron stars not being spun up, but the question of what the angular momentum they have may be important, or it may not. There's the paleomagnetism. Um, is, the, is the neutron star, for example, uh, highly magnetized? When it, when, it's, when it comes in, in its interior, it's the interior that matters, not what's on the surface. Has it got a large magnetic field there or not? That may make a difference. Um, and for the gas supply, is the gas on the outer edge of, say, an AGN accretion disk, is that magnetized with a serious amount of flux or not? Because a little bit of flux at large radius goes an awful long way at small radius when, you're, when that gas moves inward. So those are good questions. And um, so I just, just make the point here, here's a... Uh, a, a, a relativistic energy simulation, all this wonderful thing. I know because I was a, collabor a, a collaborator, although I didn't do any of the really serious work on it on this paper, and I know the sort of dirty secrets of it. Um, and it's great. Well, it's done. It's a technical tour de force. I'm, I'm really proud of it. But what was put in, you know, the, you, you get it, the output is related to the input on, in these simulations. And other ones will get different. Numbers, so there we go. So this is, this is some of the simulations. We learned a lot from it. But just to give you some examples, you can use these simulations and just comes out of it. The, say, well, what's the first thing to do is what's the density in the jet? We can use that for trying to make the model. It's purely artificial. It's just put there for numerical purposes. All right? It's, there's, it's not, there's no deceit here. It's, it's stated quite clearly. What's the velocity along the magnetic field. What's the velocity of the material in the jet? If you try to use this to get some observational input, what's the velocity of the stuff in the jet? Now, the velocity perpendicular to the magnetic field is very well defined in this simulation. There's no real problem. But the velocity along the field line is not well defined. And you, there, there are prescriptions you can use, but you just have to be very careful. There's a lot of physical processes that will determine the velocity of the plasma along the field line. And that's important if you want to put in a, want to put in a Doppler factor, for example. From this, okay. So that's thank you. So that's the initial conditions, and so you know the hope here is, in some sense, it's going to be particularly strange. The neutron star um, simulations is work hard at trying to determine what is unimportant. It may be that it really doesn't matter how much those neutron stars are spinning before they uh, get together and merge. It may be that that's quite irrelevant. That would be progress just to determine it doesn't matter. The magnetic field may not matter because a credible magnetic field in an old neutron star may be irrelevant when it comes to uh, what happens at the end, but that, we have to find that out. Let's say a bit more about magnetic field. First thing is dynamos are, are inevitable and nonlinear. Uh, we know about the MRI, um, and it's a victim of its own success because in a couple of turns, uh, it's already nonlinear, and so you have to replace it with what it actually becomes, which is very... Hard to know. The flux will possibly be conserved. It will be conserved, definitely. But will probably be convected and concentrated. And as I say, a little bit of flux at large radius goes a very long way at small radius. The, the other thing is that magnetic field is different from pressure in terms of stresses. There's the two principles of pop psychology, which are to go with the flow. And so it's convected along, usually under these circumstances, except when there's dissipation. And then the other one is push-pull, in that the stress tensor is anisotropic. There's a tension along the field, and that may be crucial for combining the jets, providing the hoop stress that combines the jets. And so gas dynamics is not the same as MHD. Now, there's, the field itself is going to be dissipative as well. And we don't really understand empirically how well electromagnetic field dissipates. We see lots of, we see, the fact that we see these non-thermal sources means that it happens, but we don't know the rules for doing it. And this is the dissipation, this is Ohm's law, this is the Ohm's law bit, and there's clearly some balance between amplifying the field through a dynamo process and, and uh, dissipating it through particle acceleration. But there's a second physical process, just going back to first principles, and that is a non-dissipative pushy, a Lorentz force, that accelerates the material in the jet. That's just J cross B. There's no dissipation associated with no heat production. It just pushes it. And those two are both important. Jet propagation, cocoons, and all of that, which you heard about from Fee and others this morning, um, this interaction of the jet with its surroundings in an AGN, in a, inside a star, inside the debris from a neutron star coalescence, and so on, 
the jet itself, there's going to be a lot of exchange of both a mass through entrainment coming into the jet and energy going outwards through noise and so on. It's, airports are noisy places. This is supersonic jets are going to make lots of, going to heat their surroundings as well. We don't understand any of that, but we have some starting to get observations which may help. So let's go back to M87 again. I said I'm going to keep on harping on this. This is the standard picture, and I'm very suspicious of it by now. The jet itself is in round numbers 10 to the 44 ergs per second. Uh, in a band here, the energy from the whole, from everything, is 10 to the 41, much less. So the jet is much more powerful than whatever's coming from any alleged accretion disk. And that's a bit of a puzzle. There's plenty of energy there from the spin. There's no problem in getting this energy out of a spinning black hole. It's easy. Field of about a kilogauss and 10 to the 34 gauss centimeters of flux does it just fine. But you need orbital, orbital gas, orbiting gas. If you're going to use this, you need orbiting gas to confine and collimate. We see that jet being collimated. You've got to have this enormous torus there that's collimating the jet, if that's what's providing the transverse confinement and that parabola, paraboloidal profile. So, if you ask how, what's the minimum mass you can do this, never mind about the accretion rate, it doesn't have to accrete at all, just what the minimum mass just to hold it in place is. And it's enormous. And the densities are so high that it's likely to de cool, even by Coulomb scattering, let alone any plasma processes. So for those reasons, I, uh, Mitch and I, and other, Mr. Spiegelman, I should say, and I, and others have become rather skeptical that there are these thick tori which are, which are present in most of these simulations. That's, that's what people put in to start off with to make dip. So think about a thin magnetic disk. Can we do this for M87? Be inspired by the sun. Imagine a two-phase medium of open field lines going through a small minority of the area of a disk and closed, field, closed loops and field lines making an active corona above them. Can you make a model that will be sufficiently dim and dull, and yet will be able to carry away the energy from the disk very efficiently by, by essentially a, a, an invisible hydromagnetic wind. So you've got magnetic field lines here, this is just a cartoon of course, and field mass being flung out on these. There's a lot of processes that go on. You get field lines that are dragged down into the disk, and then they escape by some sort of Parker buoyancy. Uh, they twist up in one period, they twist up and tangle with each other a little bit like that lamppost model, that's going on all the time. Most of the dissipation is happening in a, in a it, whatever there is, is happening in a corona quite remote from the place from where the energy is taken, which is most of the mass in the disk. That's a possibility. I won't go into the, I haven't got time to go into the details here, we've done quite a bit of thinking about this, I can't claim that we've got a viable model yet, but I think we're being driven to think about things like this by the observations of this and other sources. So um, the other thing to say is that an awful lot of work is being gone just going from the simplicity of, of MHD into the plasma physics which underlies the mechanism. OK, so let's say a little bit about this connection of going from these wonderful simulations that are being made to the observational world and going backwards and forwards between the simulations and the observations. Now, the first thing you have to say is you have to include emissivity, opacity, and radiative transfer. And the opacity must be, is both scattering and absorptive. And when the case of AGN jets, and I think there are other ones too, uh, when you think about the scattering, you're often thinking about inverse Compton scattering and so on, and that's clearly important. And you have to include the radiation that's extraneous to the jet, as well as what's created inside it. And this is sort of well understood in the blazar and so on studies. Uh, but it, it's very important. There's a lot of uncertainty there. And basically, people have, got to have, have started to believe the phenomenology. When I see these uh, models of uh, uh, radio emission from shocks, a bit like this morning, people have little rules of thumb that they use which, as far as I know, relatively little microphysical basis. And um, we, we can talk about that later. But the simulations are starting to be performed. But when you say, well, there is equipartition, and there will be a power law distribution, so on, that's a, a, that's a precept. It's a reasonable thing to assume. But it doesn't have, in these mildly relativistic shocks, for example, it doesn't have a very strong basis 
in fundamental electrodynamics. Um, so we've got to compare various prescriptions that are basically phenomenological with the observations. And you may get this may be the fastest route to the truth. The variability. Again, we've got now these long observing campaigns of AGN and many other types of sources. And people are doing much more sophisticated analyses of the associated time series, asking if they're reversible, for example. That's another good question to ask. We can ask the same uh, questions of the, simu of the simulations. You can integrate over orientation and, re and redshift, as George showed us this morning, and therefore and then compare with the source samples, trying to get to these selection effects. And again, as George showed us this morning, there are not just these tr sins of emission, as I call them, but there's the sins of transmission, things that can happen to the radiation along the side, including absorption of gamma rays or in its absence, which would turn out to be rather interesting, uh, and possibly gravitational lensing at some level of the black hole binaries. So here's just a, I'm not going to have time to go into this in any detail. This is just some work that I've been associated with a little bit, but uh, there's many other people who've been doing this, who, well, there's one, there's one example, uh, the idea of what are the mechanisms under these circumstances for getting energy into relativistic particles and into, into photons. Um, magnetic reconnection in, is a, it's much more complicated than just that, as this picture at least should make clear, um, than non-relativistic reconnection. But it does have the capacity of being relatively efficient at making particles, but it's not going to be fast enough for the Crab-type flares, these very rapid flares. It's not going to do that. Instead, what one should look for is sort of dynamical untangling of field lines. If you imagine making a little slip knot like that and sort of do that, I mean, that's just a bit of a metaphor, but it's not entirely a metaphor. It's the sort of thing that happens with magnetic field when you do things without violating helicity. And that can happen at the speed of light, and that can produce a, uh, a, a very large inductive electric field and so on. And these are some sort of simulations of an idealized case that show just the sort of physics that could happen without applying it directly to any particular source. So observing these simulations, I just make one sort of slightly preachy hate, is that one of the things I think is getting in a bit of trouble in cosmology is that people are proud of using exactly the same routines to get simulations and data, and they say we'll analyze things in exactly the same way and so on. And this, this, this needs to group think, of course, and instead it's, be, it's more, more healthy to actually seek for discord rather than, um, so just be careful, watch out for that, I would say. Okay. Some homilies about um, uh, instrumentation, observation, simulation theory. I, again, I just sort of, kind of, I'm not sure if it's terribly useful, but I, I, you know, it used to be that people were able to do science very quickly, and now we're looking at sort of enormously long programs to make LIGO. Hubble Space Telescope took 46 years from inception to launch, and so on and so forth. Um, and then things, things plotted out to the 2030s and 40s and all the rest of it. We heard some wonderful things of that. That's important. The flagships, or whatever they're called, are going to be very important. But the rad rapid adaptation, the sort of things that Greg told us about, where he's able to go down to Radio Shack and buy some equipment and, uh, uh, and then get, something, get some results out within a year, that, that is equally important to getting that balance. And I sometimes worry that those, that eats that. Okay. And for keeping that one going instead of that lot. OK. Um, the, the, this is sort of, multi, we're in the multi-messenger regime, so I'm preaching to the choir here, but many of our colleagues only ever know one narrow band of the electromagnetic spectrum and are very suspicious of anything else. Um, learn to live with that and help them mend their ways. Um, so simulation is not just to make models of sources, but to get the principles right and beware these computational fixes. And then I think, again, perhaps be prepared I think the cosmologists have overthought the connection to fundamental physics and learning new laws and basic principles. Um, people in this community might have underthought it a tiny bit, and it should be on the lookout for new tests, to say, of Q with magnetars of QED and all the rest of it. That's not, nothing particularly profound behind that. But you know, be prepared to fail fast in these sort of ventures. Now, quickly for the prospects, of course, gravitational radiation, um, uh, LIGO, and so on. Um, the Event Horizon Telescope, they already have the data. It's been shipped out from the South Pole last November. How long, how long it takes them to understand it is, I don't know. How long it takes the team to agree what they've understood will be even longer. And I think some people will, under, will sympathize with that sentiment. Um, but at any rate, they've got Sajay Star and M87, and everybody knows they've got fringes. So this is at least a, 
a very successful experiment, and it's hard, this is hardness, and they, they've done it. Um, so what happens, we're all eager to see. The fast radio burst, I think we might hear a little bit about that to, on Wednesday, I'm not sure. That's a fast-moving field, too, and it's great. The neutrino transistors here, the TV gamma rays, and so on. Again, there are things happening here, and they will happen on a fairly short time scale. So at the prospect, you know, we aren't waiting for 2030 for something to happen. It's going to happen in the time scale of years. So there's the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, this is sort of what, what it is. There's Alma. Uh, here's, um, uh, here's simulations of what it's going to see. They're actually even more exotic ones than that. Of course, you're not going to see anything like that. My own view is, oh, uh, this is high energy density physics, which may be the future. Um, oh, something got messed up there. Uh, there we go. That's what I wanted to show. Um, my own view of what the Event Horizon Telescope is going to show is it may well be not all the lovely rings and so on around the black hole, the shadow of the black hole and all of that, you may be dominated by the approaching jet. And that we will learn from that. And in that spirit, I would say quite generically, this is stuff I done with Richard Nancho and so on, making sort of simple uh, numerical and analytical models that it showed clearly here. There are various effects. One is because of, if you're looking at a helical field like that, one side of the jet will be brighter than the other because of the way synchrotron radiation works. The linear polarization is more or less dictated. The, um, if there are features there, the velocity you should be able to see. So in principle, one can learn a lot about the launching of jets from these observations, even if you aren't able to see quite right down to the black hole and what's going on around it. And this limb brightening, will, it isn't present in this simulation, but it is present in in the observations, and it's easy enough to find a reason for it. I'm changing things here. And the angular frequency here, in this case, in, in this case if this, this was the west, west prop pointing jet in M87, it should, it's the other way around, in fact, and so the bright part should be on this side, because that's given by that gas that I told you about that was known to be orbiting in M87. So there's some fairly clear predictions here. And so here's the sort of summary. Let me finish at this point. Thank you. <coughs> You mentioned this uh, uh, um, paradigm, this, this, this suggestion of, uh, that is often used to, to um, model, uh, to describe AGN, extragalactic jets, which is the, the, the spinal layer, spine and sheath mm -hmm. uh, 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 scenario. Could this be, after all, an analog of Svipiran's cousin? Yes, that was, that was my point. I was just sort of trying gently to say that there was some... Uh, discussion, maybe uh, correct, maybe not, maybe misguided, of that sort of velocity um, profile being developed in a jet. Yeah. A this goes, goes a, back a, right a, a, An yeah. extragalactic scale cocoon. I mean, yeah. Uh, well, no, well, no, the cocoons, as Sri said, uh, as Sri said, so there were, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, another word for them is the waste energy basket, which is what Peter Scheuer called them. And so basically the idea was that a jet. Uh, supplies too much energy for the momentum it needs to propagate into its surrounding. So that energy has to go somewhere. In those, in those days, it was thought to go up to a, a, a hot spot, a strong shock at the end of the jet, and then backflow around the jet. And that was a sort of burst version of a cocoon. Uh, it can also go laterally uh, by being a noisy jet and go sideways. And as Sri you know, really said, um, you know, and it, it, that gets modified seriously in the case of, a, G, of uh, a GRB because we have this sort of waste energy and then we have this, the weak shots that are propagating out to whatever's outside the, the, pro, the infalling protostar, the infalling star, excuse me, or the debris from the neutron star coalescence. And that can make this cocoon, which can then in principle break out, we will break out eventually, and it can dominate the emission that's actually observed. So, yeah, so I think well, the, best, the bottom line message is we can learn from each other. The AGN community can learn from the GRB community and vice versa. Uh, all right. Any other questions? Please. So wh what is your take about this uh, extremely high energy events like that uh, are above the 
burn of limit or what is your uh, idea of how to generate this uh, very, uh, few hundred GV events from, from the crab for example uh, we know that they are beyond the synchrotron limit uh, you mean the crab you mean the, the variability the, the, not, not just the variability the very high energy how do you produce the very high energy from the pulsar I mean yeah Oh well, well, I, I think um, I think the, the curvature models are dead. You can't get more than about a hundred GeV. So that that was really stretching things. So uh, I would say that it's not it's not certainly not I think it's inverse Compton. I mean, I, I personally I always thought that, but it's inverse Compton. It has to be inverse Compton, and there's plenty of potential difference. There's uh, about eighty petavolts of potential difference in the Crab pulsar. So that's ample to make. Electrons to radiate these energies. You know, it's just radiation reaction that sort of stops you going in any higher. All right. Uh, do we have uh, further questions? Uh, if not the case, uh, uh, please join me thank Roger for his wonderful talk. Thank you.